Recording in progress. All right. Welcome, everyone, to week 10 of Revelation on Monday night. So as I mentioned in the last class, we are left Houston, back up here in the panhandle. Brian and Anita, Susan, girls coming in later here. Welcome all of you on Zoom and those of you later who will join by YouTube. Uh, not asking for pity, but like, wow, it's colder here than it is down there for you in Houston. It's been, yeah, I told them in the first class we had snow flurries today. It's been hovering around 32, 34. Uh, so we had uh, another dash of winter up here. Um, look here. as we get ready to start. Manual, uh, well, I failed to say earlier, you're, you're up late uh, being with us. You're past midnight there in the UK. But you're there and you unmute okay and Not have stepped away from the last class. Let me get you to pray. And, um, Dukes, what about you? Are you there where you can unmute? Yeah, Cook. Cook. There you are. Um, Jukes, would you want to pray for us as we get ready to, to study? And I mentioned in the last class, let's keep praying for Muslims around the world through Ramadan that okay. Okay. millions will come to faith in Christ. So we pray for our class and as we begin to get ready to study. Okay. Hallelujah. Yeah. Father, we just thank you. Uh, we are grateful we again are grateful that you uh, we bless your holy name. Always, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for using Kirk. We thank you also uh, for all the people that have gathered together, the students and the uh, uh, everyone, the leaders um, from every community, um, from all around um, Texas and, and within. Uh, we are grateful that you have brought us together again. And we know that today it's about your word. At the end of the day, it's about to be. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will take all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. We pray for our Muslim brothers uh, during this Ramadan time. Uh, we pray that, uh, God, you will touch their hearts. Holy Spirit, move in them, walk in them, that they will come see Jesus. They will come know Jesus. They will bring their faith to Christ. Father, Lord, touch each and every one of them in the name of Jesus Christ. And I pray, oh, Lord, today, as, as we go into your word, open our hearts to receive. Open our hearts to receive what you have for us, this word, and we'll be able to apply this word unto our lives, to our families, to our businesses, uh, to our children, and to everyone that we meet and we we'll witness unto them and that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And thank you, Chooks. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Well, we don't have a long text tonight, so uh, we may be finishing up a little bit early. As sure as I say that, then sometimes I end up going long. So, but don't let that keep any of you from inputting, please. Uh, but uh, interesting that in the first class, we're covering everything from Ezekiel to Malachi. So, large sections to cover every night and doing just revelation alone it's a much slower pace so we only have uh just part of 14 and and a short 15 uh to deal with tonight 
I'd like to begin uh, with the video. I've backed up. We were in 13, finishing up 13. So remember, as we talked about uh, last week, and I believe Sean was one that might have used the term, but the, the, the counterfeit trinity of the, of the dragon uh, out of 12. So let's say uh, Prince of Darkness, the dragon, and the, the two beasts, one from the land, one from the sea. Uh, and uh, so we go through 13. So this is finishing up 13. Uh, we pray you kind of keep in mind the point 666 has always been such a big deal. Oh, oh what's it going to be implanted with the chip? Maybe it was going to be through the vaccine. But let's just understand that 666 has appeared throughout history. That uh, when empires demand uh, obedience, whether they mark in some way a person or not, that is in essence. Uh, being tagged with the 666, that they, the beast demands allegiance. Uh, in, and you can't buy and trade with that. And we said that's happened to brothers and sisters. That happens, I work with Nasser in Pakistan, that happens to brothers and sisters there. They can't, they can't be part of the normal business community because they follow Jesus. So in that sense, uh, you know, they are excluded. Uh, from the normal economic uh, activities of that of that uh, country, that people in China, Christians, you know, in a sense, suffer from not having this mark as they have most heavily monitored uh, nation in the world right now through video cameras and all, and they have social currency that they build up social points and Christians lose those because of their worship of God. So it's just acknowledge that it just takes different forms with different empires that we don't need to go looking for just one thing that's going to happen to the whole globe. If that comes down the pike, well, that's another matter, but we're looking at how it plays out in history so far. Yes, Kimba. Thanks, Brother Kirk. Um, I know I know this is something that is such a like you said, people have said there's so many so much conspiracy theories about going around about you know the new world order and all the stuff that that they think people will do in the future. But my question is, as a Christian, if something like that were to come about, and let's say it didn't hinge on your faith, like rejecting Christ to say have some type of card or have some type of currency that you can use to either buy food or or something like that do you think it would be sinful for a christian to say have something like that as as long as they're not turning their back on their faith to to get it yeah yeah and that's a that's a a good and question, Kenba, if I was quicker on my toes, I'd be able to call up an equivalent historically. There have been Christians through ages that have still managed to operate in the context, and sometimes it might, you know, uh, require you know, let's just say, for example, let, let's say in Kenya now, they they were leaders, world leaders in using digital currency. So when I help some brothers and sisters there, it's very easy to get the money. But let's say that was weaponized against Christians or Christians have been utilizing that and they pay no allegiance to to an empire in, in doing that. Now, again, it could be weaponized in such a way that it would make it difficult for them to use it. but I, I think it's a case where, um, you know, we, and it's not a cop-out because every, every context has nuances and there are 
factors that you bring to bear on it. So we, we couldn't sit here and say 50 years, 100 years hence, if a person does this, they're not a, they're not a believer. I think we would all be comfortable with that, trying to judge something, and we're not even there in that context. So, you know, uh, Jesus calls us to the difficult balance. I want you to be street wise, shrewd as a serpent, and innocent as a dove. And I hear in Jesus doing that, giving us the latitude uh, to be street savvy, to be just as wily as they are. And so if we leverage some platforms in order to do that, but we are always clear about where our allegiance is, that's what matters. So, yeah. Uh, I'll admit, kind of a, a difficult one, but I think there are some principles to guide us. Uh, number one, that we need to be there in walking in those shoes. And what does obedience to Jesus look like under this empire? Because that's basically what the message of Revelation is. This is what it looked like for Roman Christians in the first century under Nero than Domitian. And so what it looks like for us today in our world empires looks different than it did for them. But the bottom line is still patient endurance like we talked about last week. So I'll stop there. And I hope that's, uh, that's helpful uh, to some degree. Again, bottom line, God honors us using our wits and our brains and, and Jesus, and he calls us to, Jesus says, unfortunately, sometimes you people of the kingdom, to use some of his language from another time, are duller than you should be. Are duller, you're not as sharp with it as people who are not of the kingdom. So learn to be wise and wily, but Remain innocent. Keep your allegiance to God only. So, good, good question. Let's we'll pick up with this little section. It's going to move into fourteen. The Lamb. Again, we don't get hung up on the one forty four. It's a it's a larger number. Chapter seven said one forty four. He heard one forty four. When he looked, he saw a countless number. So it's going to be the same repeat of this. We have these. When we come to 14, these sections of worship, chapters 4 and 5, 7, 14, and 15, and about five different places where we have these grand scenes of worship. Well, of the ancient pattern set out by Daniel, that the nations become beasts when they exalt their own power and economic security as a false god and then demand total allegiance. So Babylon was the beast in Daniel's day, but that was followed by Persia, followed by Greece, and now Rome in John's day. And so it goes for any later nation that acts in the same way. Standing opposed to the beastly nations and the dragon is another king. It's the slain lamb. He's with his army who have given their lives to follow him. And from the new Jerusalem, their song of victory goes out to the nations in what John calls the eternal gospel. And they call everyone to repent and to worship God and to come out of Babylon that will fall. Its days are numbered. Then John sees a vision of final judgment. It's symbolized by two harvests. One is a good harvest of grain as King Jesus comes to gather up his faithful people to himself. The other is a harvest of wine grapes. It represents humanity's intoxication with evil. They're taken to the wine press and trampled. Now, throughout all these sign visions, John is placing a stark choice before the seven churches. Will they resist the lure of Babylon and follow the lamb? Or will they follow the beast and suffer its defeat. Now that the choice is clear, John replays a final cycle of seven divine judgments, symbolized as pouring out seven bowls. Now we know from the Lamb's scroll and from the sign visions that many among the nations do repent. But as the Exodus plagues are repeated and poured out through the bowls, there are many people who do not repent. They resist and curse God, just like Pharaoh. And so it all leads up to the Pause there because that really the seven bowls gets into uh, gets in to make sure 
my my audio meter doesn't always show in Zoom like it should. So y'all, I rely on y'all to let me know if you ever can't hear me. Uh, but that gets into 16. We're going through the harvest, uh, the grain harvest of the good, the wine, uh, wine, the grape harvest, uh, you know, of the disobedient. And then we get into 15, this again, this throne, kind of a throne room scene. Um, so we will be, first, so I appreciate the way that it's not only Mackie and the Bible Project guys that do these contrasts. Uh, so empires, uh, from Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and then you come on through to today, empires that we live under are going to want to demand subservience. So again, China's doing it in one way, North Korea's doing it in a slightly different uh, way. Uh, in the world of radical Islam, uh, obedience is demanded. The mark would be kind of like the, the verbal saying, um, there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. That would kind of be like the mark of the beast. If you don't do that, then you're not gonna, you'll either be killed, but if not, you're marginalized in society. Education, it's hard to get your kids educated. It's hard to get an ID card. Uh, it's, it's hard to carry on business. So we've got our brothers and sisters suffering under that today not in every single Islamic nation, but in quite a few where it's uh, more radical. So we always have the empires seeking to control and behind the empires, behind the earthly beast, of course, is the, is the dragon, is that, that power of darkness. So we, uh, we are locked as John does both in the Gospel of John, contrasting light and darkness in the, the letters to John. He does, he talks about light and darkness again. Uh, it, it's interesting in a sense with light and darkness, there's not a battle. Light doesn't come out violently and decimate the darkness. Light shines. It is a, it is a nonviolent witness. Jesus, Matthew 5, let your light shine before men. And so we, we are of the light and we have, we have that challenge because we live in two different worlds. We live in an earthly empire, but we're citizens or followers of Jesus, followers of the Lamb. I'd rather even say instead of citizens of the kingdom because that removes our leader kind of from the picture. Uh, we're not just citizens of, of, of heaven waiting for that. We're followers of the lamb who has called us to nonviolently uh, remain faithful. And we don't pray down vengeance on the unbelievers. We let our light shine and want to find people drawn. So we see in 14, this, this harvest of two. Now I want to make a quick switch back over to one of the books on Revelation that's been helpful to me. Uh, we covered this last week with the first part of, of chapter 14. Uh, actually, we don't have a lot to read tonight. So I think we're going to use others of you to help read. Uh, Kenva, before I read this little section, would you read uh, for us from Revelation? Repeat what we covered last week, 14, 1 through 5. Do you want me to read it on the one that's on the screen? Or... Yeah, if you don't mind, uh, okay. since everybody's seeing that and they'll be able to follow along. Okay. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven, like the roar of rushing waters, and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. 
And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remain virgins. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. All right. Thank you. I made a brief, uh, addressed it briefly last week. I want us to not get tripped up here on four. The Bible says with women, they're not talking about literal uh, sexual intercourse. That's not the point here. In the context of empires, to, to remain faithful to God is to, to not bow down to the gods of our culture, um, you know, entertainment or whatever it is, whatever form it takes, uh, to remain faithful, to keep ourselves, to realize we're following Jesus, to keep ourselves uh, for him. So just in, in a nutshell, that, that's the gist of, of that. Uh, so from this 14, what I didn't read last week, um, it's here, what I highlighted, go back. So I'm just reading the highlighted portion down here. In the preceding chapter, we saw John present a terrifying picture involving a dragon, Satan, two hideous beasts, one from the sea, one from the earth. The beast came from the sea, the beast from the sea curses God, makes war against the followers of Jesus, 13, 5, and 7, while the second beast works in concert as it compels all who are not followers of the Lamb to worship the first beast. Juxtaposed with this horrific vision is the picture of Revelation 14. There the Lamb stands on Mount Zion with 144,000 followers, or back to chapter 7, a countless number. As previously noted, this number represents fullness and completeness. How many of the Lamb's followers are lost to the beast? Zero, zip, nada. Uh, what are they doing there on Mount Zion with Jesus? They're singing their song. And that doesn't mean none die, but because we've already seen martyrs, uh, but the beast does not have them. So it, they're singing their new song. In scripture, a new song is one that celebrates some new aspect of God's love and care. And then it, it quotes some from Psalm 40, Isaiah 42, and notice that only people, the only people capable of singing the song are those who have been redeemed. You can't name it if you don't claim it. Um, then we get on into the text that we're going to be uh, going on to read. I'm going to, if you don't mind, Kenva, since you were reading, I know you can unmute easily. If you would just read, keep reading 6 uh, on through 13. Yes, sir. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. 
Okay, thank you. We'll get to that rest and remembrance. Uh, but you have these angels, <laughs> three angels. And in short, it's consistent with the whole message of, of Revelation, be faithful. The first angel, fear God, give him glory. Uh, and notice again, the use of every uh, nation, tribe, language, and people that we saw first in, in chapters four and five in that worship scene, people from every chapter five, people from every tribe, language, uh, nation, and people. Uh, so for us, as we live in this world today, uh, with all the political turmoil in our own country here, with uh, elections coming up. We don't have to be unsettled by all of that. Again, we've said it before. We keep Hebrews 12, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And that doesn't mean that we're so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly good, that little saying. We, we have to keep ourselves centered. When there's chaos going on around us, we keep ourselves centered, remembering Again, Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. And I, I love that. You are God, I am not. It's, it's therapeutic, it's helpful to me. You're God, I'm not. Now, none of us would ever say, I am God. We we you know, we'd never be so brash. But in our and we can live as if it all depends on us. And we live with we can live with with such stress and it's not an easy task to literally learn how to take Jesus up. Matthew 10, the end of Matthew 10. Come to me, you who are weary. 11. I always have trouble with that. Is it the end of 10 or 11? I think 11. Thank you. Uh, 11. If you're worn out, come and I will give you rest. Uh, we have to learn how to get some of that rest from the pressures and from the chaos. And part of that comes from saying, okay, God, I can't handle it all. You can. And that doesn't mean he's going to go through the day and make every decision for us that we have to make. No, we're still faced with things that we have to do. But if we live with an awareness of Emmanuel, God is with us. That is one of the practical steps that we take in doing what the angel is saying here. Love God, fear God, give him glory. Uh, worship, worship him. And he's made even the things that are can seem chaos to people, the sea, to Israel, the sea was a place of darkness and chaos. But God made it. God is God over that. And so we have to let him come into our chaos and help calm us. Second angel, <laughs> Babylon the Great, this time that was Rome. Nero, Domitian, saying, they hadn't seen him fall yet. This was, you know, the Christians reading this was like, well, sounds good, but it hasn't happened. They were under the, still under the boot of that empire. Uh, it would be another 300 years before, you know, Rome would fall. Uh, but it's like saying it is a sure thing. And in the meantime, so hundreds of years. So for us, no, we don't know when Jesus will return. Let's assume it won't be in our lifetime. How do we then live? Faithfulness, patient endurance, being light passing it on, passing our love for Jesus on to the next generation. So announcing the empires will fall, but be patient. Here he will come. God will deal with injustice, as we see in these middle verses. But in 12 is part of what we need. Until then, it calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God and those who remain faithful to Jesus. So we, in our 
in our time that we live. We don't pray, not come and give them, give them what they deserve. That's not our prayer. We're not, it's not a prayer of vengeance. Um, we, last week, Byron asked a good question about, hey, I'm trying to wrap my mind around patient endurance. And, uh, you know, uh, I did a poor job at trying to explain it, but the, one of the best that I could come up with is we all endure, and I endured through my 20s and 30s and some of my spiritual immaturity, but it was an impatient endurance. Kicking and screaming, God, why are you letting this happen? Where are you? So impatient endurance. I didn't throw in the towel, but it wasn't, my heart was not a great place to live. And during some of those times, I would say for Susan and me now, and he's a couple of past decade or so, we've learned a little bit more of patient endurance to be patient with all that we see around us and our own selves, including our own hearts. Wesley Hill, quoting a German poet, almost can remember her name, but be patient with all that is unfinished within you. Patience with yourself, patience with unbelievers, the other political party that we might disagree with, or the other side of whatever issue, patient endurance. Uh, we, we pledge allegiance primarily to God, to him alone. Now, you know, yes, we may stand up, we may say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, but let's be aware when we're doing that. Let's, let's do not try to make this a, like, okay, in the sense that this is a Christian nation. No, our allegiance is first and foremost to God and to him alone. That doesn't mean that we're not supportive, that we're not patriotic. It just means we have our priorities. We see clearly, we're not trying to create a, quote, Christian nation, which as I've noted before, it never has been. Yes, we can go back and look at some foundations, but there were cracks in those foundations from the very beginning. Again, having implemented one of the most brutal forms of slavery that the world had seen up to that time of the 1700s and the 1800s. So that's, that is part of the foundation, some very, some deep fallenness in our foundation. So that should disabuse us of, an, of a desire or a notion to, to look back on a certain time in our country and say, well, that's what we want to recreate. Well, it depends on whether you were at a, in a privileged place in society and you want to look back on that, or if, if you weren't in one of those privileged places, that's not something you want to go back and live through again. So that's why, that's why our focus on, on good. God is the, is the only one who is holy and right and good. Now, we can exercise our democratic rights, vote. We need to vote responsibly. Yes, do those things. Um, but relieve ourselves of a constant gnawing that can be there when we live in a, in a culture that we see, turn, see it turning its back on God in some ways don't long for the good old days. They never were the good old days. What we, what we always strive for is faithfulness to Jesus, speaking of Jesus, and being salt and light to people. And again, that's always nonviolently. We will speak of the goodness of God as demonstrated through Jesus. So this... That's just such a loaded statement in 12. It calls living under empires always calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God. Any thoughts, reflections, and maybe in the week since then, somebody's come up with some sharper thoughts, some even better thoughts on uh, endurance. There you go, Brian. I just thought it was worthy of note uh, after the first angel comes and, and says, fear God. And I don't know uh, if fear is the normal word 
mm-hmm. which means awe, um, you know, be in awe of God and give him glory. But uh, I noticed that everything that the angel says is things that are God that God is in control of and over the beasts. So he says, worship him who made the heavens. And up in verse one or verse two, I heard a sound from heaven, like the roaring of washing, rushing waters. So you have heaven and the springs of waters. And then you have the earth and the sea. And that's where the beast came out of. And, and I think the message is God's in control. It doesn't matter where the beasts come from. God created it all and he's in control. And so that's why you can be in awe of God um, and give him the glory that even though we may be going through the ringer, that God is in control and there's, there's nothing that God, that God can't handle. He's going to handle the, the beast of the earth and of the sea. Uh, He's Lord of the heavens and the earth. And so it, it just kind of, to me, it just kind of gave that sense of, um, yeah, there's, there's all of this good news, you know, about Babylon falling and, and, um, and then the warning and everything, but it's precluded by God is, God is in control. Yeah. Well, that's good. Thank you for going a little deeper with that there. I, I like that, uh, because, in 13, one of the beasts came from the earth. The other beasts came from the sea. Uh, so you could look at those and say, yeah, sources of opposition and evil. But here God is calmly God still over all of that. And he made, so you know they're not inherently in rebellion against him, but empires of people who come and inhabit them are. But here God is still, still God. And, and that's so good. And we fall in this Babylon and we hear patient endurance. So I wanted to go back over here, this brother, not all of this. Uh, three, and starting here, three angels now appear to communicate back. Where'd you go? Three angels now appear to communicate in verbal form. The message we've been seeing through images. The first angel reminds us that the time for judgment has come. The second angel speaks of Babylon, Rome, has fallen and indicts her for intoxicating the nations with her adulteries. The third angel speaks judgment to those who worship the beast in his image. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything has been confirmed. Three angels. In contrast to this, a blessing is pronounced on the dead who die in the Lord. The spirit agrees and adds, they will rest from their labor, their deeds will follow them. I'm sure one of the truths John's readers are to see in this is that death in the Lord is superior to life without him. For some of them would be forced to act upon their belief in regard to this, to be willing to die for the Lord. Beyond that, though, it also says something to those who are practicing patient endurance from verse 12. Anything that involves endurance isn't easy. And continuing in the conflict, and opposition these churches were experiencing had to be extremely difficult and exhausting. In such cases, choosing to practice the will of God became the path, not of least resistance, but of much resistance. Now, they had the choice of working or wilting, and they chose to work. In the end, isn't that the way it works out for all of us? Sooner or later, don't we all encounter obstacles in following Christ? Maybe it's the challenge to love someone who's hateful towards us. It might be resisting something that strongly tempts us. Or perhaps it's practicing humility in front of the arrogant. Obstacles come in all shapes, sizes, and degrees, but in the end, they usually demand the same thing of us, that we intensify our efforts. To do this, consist- to do this consistently is to practice patient endurance. And we're assured here of two things, rest and remembrance. Death will bring cessation of need for these labors. um, And their deeds will follow them. They are remembered. Your good deeds are not forgotten. So I just appreciated that. That that was helpful in trying to step back again and and sometimes get a 30,000-foot view of these images that were being given the three angels chapter 16 you'll get to the seven bowls uh the two harvest here 
I'm looking. Um, so we're moving on towards 15. So what have we seen here in 12, 13, and 14? As we move towards Rome's ultimate judgment, disciples have received complete assurance by seeing Satan defeated three times. Revelation 12. This being so, we know that the two beasts that align themselves with him, though fierce and gruesome, 13, will go down to defeat as well. While the wicked are defeated, the righteous, as has been the constant theme of the book, are brought through it all and sing the, their song of deliverance. And not, again, not brought through it unsinged, some through death, but still they come through. This deliverance is pictured in the harvesting of the earth while the three angels speak against the wicked who were thrown into the wine press of God's wrath. So those are the two harvests here in the, in the later part. And I'm about to get to the, the scene in heaven in 15. But just to go back and... And uh, if you don't mind, would you finish up 14 there, uh, verses uh, 14 to the end? Is that for me, Brother Kirk? Yes. Uh, would you mind reading 14 to the end for us? Yes, sir. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel, who had a charge of the fire, came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. Okay. Thank you. So when we, when we hear like in this, even into one of the uh, songs, um, kind of patriotic songs, I, I forget the, mm -hmm. uh, the grapes of wrath are stored. Yes. And, so when we when we we get imagery like this that can stick with us and blood rising as high as the horse's bridles and so we can translate that into some literal images there's got to be a great slaughter again millions and blood flowing so no again no this is uh symbolism uh even when we're hearing this about the wrath of god do not do not take this as the only thing that you, uh, as your dominant image of God, this has to be, this has to be weighed against the other things that we read in Scripture that Jesus shows us. No one has seen what we want. An, we want to see an exact image of God. We look to Jesus again, Hebrews one three. He is the exact representation of God. And so, when we reading this, it doesn't mean that God doesn't know how to bring about justice, but it's too easy for our images of this to be of a wrathful, vengeful God. As we mentioned last time again, kind of a typical human, and even Jonathan Edwards, good preaching in some other ways, but not sinners in the hand of an angry God. Uh, that is our human interpretation of some of these images. This is not uh, what Jesus reveals to us of God. Yes, Dealing with injustice, he will. He knows how to do it fairly and justly. God is a God of love. John 3, 16, he's so loved that he gave. 1 John 4, 8, God is love. So we have to factor that in as we hear this. But again, make sure that we don't hear this, this blood flowing. Yes, there's going to be a great slaughter. 
of somehow again the Jesus, the nonviolent Jesus of the gospel, is going to somehow morph, become a transformer, this hyperviolent Jesus of Revelation. No, that is not the case. It's not even the Jesus that we see. He appears as a slain lamb. So just noting that because we can, some of those images can stick in our mind. But backing up here, just because we hear this uh, like a son of man, we think, oh, Jesus, well, but in this case, no, uh, because another angel comes from the temple, calls out, says, take your sickle and read. So this is, you know, two angels working together. You have two other angels working together here, harvest on earth, the harvest, harvest of grain, kind of a harvest of, of wine here. The, the main, the gist of all of this is, Again, God will know how to harvest justly and fairly. Jesus shows us that in parables, separating sheep from the goats or uh, the, the parable of the fish and sorting the fish. Uh, God, God knows how to do that justly. Yes, Sean. In one of the classes that I had taken on uh, studying this before, the first angel actually was a a belief is they harvested believers because first of all it said uh so he who was seated on the cloud swung a sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested it didn't say it was grapes um and it was completed ed and then the yeah. second one harvested the unbelievers so it's once again showing the love and also the judgment right Right, you have those those two parts, and, and and God, when He does it, He knows how to do it justly. And it's just our problem is, we we want to make those judgment calls on who's in and who's out, and we just we simply cannot do that. That's kind of the image here in Tim Mackey in the video, the final justice, this final part of fourteen, harvest of God's people, harvest of humanity's humanity's evil, and. Uh, uh, the Lord is the one who, uh, even Jesus in his parable, notes that it is God who does the sorting. Uh, when workers volunteer to go sort the, the weed, even the, the weed from the tares from the crop, he said, no, because you might pull up some of the good with the bad. And he said, we as humans, we, we can't do that kind of looking into the hearts of people and judging the way that that god can so uh, that doesn't diminish at all the other side of god i'm not saying you know that there's uh, that, that god as a god of love doesn't know how to be just but that's yet yeah, he is a god of love and out of that love he acts and remembering even what ezekiel tells us he doesn't delight even in the death of the wicked so it's just important here in, in this language that we don't get the picture of God just uh, rubbing his hands together in glee as humanity is decimated. He doesn't delight in the death of anyone, the death of the wicked. Uh, we go to 15, and not a very long one, uh, but one of our other uh, heavenly scenes. So we said chapters four, five, seven, 14 and 15. And I'll give Kimba a break and let one of y'all would, uh, would you want to read Anita? And I think I would let you, if you would, just go ahead and read the short chapter. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. 
After this, I looked and I saw in the heaven, I saw in heaven, the temple that is the tabernacle of the covenant law. And it was opened out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels, seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed and so 16 that leads on into 16 and the seven bowls uh yeah thank you um see a glass fire uh those who've been victorious over the beast the faithful those who have patiently endured who had suffered, died, as many of our brothers and sisters are in the world today, giving their lives. So they're part of that, together with us who remain faithful here on earth, who patiently endure here. Uh, we've said it before, really not a question of us being able to die for the Lord. I think all of us could. The greater challenge is to live daily for the Lord. And so that's calls for patient endurance. And so this declaration of praise uh, to God, great and marvelous are your deeds. Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways. King of the nations who will not fear you, bring glory to your name. You alone are holy. All nations will come before you in worship. Um, and that image and we'll see it even as we finish up in Revelation 21. And uh, this city of God, her gates are never shut. The, the trees are for the healing of the nations. And I just say all of that can kind of mess with some of our clear cut pictures that we have of, oh, heaven is, heaven is like this. Um, uh, because he gives some imagery even later here that, well, why is there any healing needed if it, in this city of God? Gates are never shut and trees are for the healing. The leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nation. So what needs healing if, if we're all in a utopia? And so all of that to say we don't, we don't have the answer to the way that it will be. We know it will be good. And we get glimpses of it here. But let's don't rule out the people, the nations coming to worship. Uh, how does God juggle all of this? In some of our, uh, in some of our imagery that we've inherited through the centuries, even some of Revelation doesn't fit, especially the latter part there that we'll see with the holy city. Uh, but God's desire. When we, when we come across several times judgment of the disobedient, the unrighteous, the wicked, uh, that can begin to dominate our, our view of God and everything that's happening. We're living with the mixture of light and dark alongside each other, good and evil alongside each other, and we just need to make sure that we are conditioned as followers of Jesus to love those who are in darkness, to be witnesses to them. It's not a time of judgment for them. And I shared with, I think, pretty sure, wasn't it? Last week I shared because with both classes, the, the short text from the brother from the 1800s who talked about the fruit of light and darkness maturing alongside each other. And that's what we see in our world today. Um, lightness, the fruit of light continues to mature. The fruit of darkness continues to mature. And so uh, we don't stand back and curse the darkness or talk about how bad it is. Uh, we, we patiently live among those who are in darkness and we let our light shine so that God gets the glory. And so this kind of imagery, this return to these throne room scenes 
and to inspire us that not to conjure up some picture of what we think heaven will be like, but just to, to trust that God has that worked out. And our faithfulness to Jesus is what is required of us, this patient endurance. Here they sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. You may have grown up singing a song mentioning Mo the song of Moses and the Lamb. Um, what is Moses? What is the Lamb? Well, can't say for sure. The Lamb is about, if you take John 1, law came through Moses, grace and truth came through, through Jesus. But it's this new song of God doing a great thing like he spoke of in Isaiah, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Do you perceive it? But he's doing that even in our day. Do we perceive it? And that makes all the difference in the world between us living with a box hole mentality, hanging in there, huddling together against the darkness instead of early Christians in Rome were right out among the darkness and their light shone by taking in the infants that the Rome, the Romans exposed to the elements to either be eaten by the wild dogs, the, the packs of roaming dogs, or to die from the elements that Christians took these in. So that's the image of light among darkness that we need. Yes, things can be difficult around us, but there is no darkness that can overcome the light whenever we are connected to the source the sun himself his light will shine through us uh, any other thoughts reflections on this here yeah brian i you know we we talked in the earlier chapters about the um, idea of god being just a, a marionette and, and you know uh, having glee at the downfall of a people, but that's what this song tells us that it's not. Yeah, great and marvelous are your deeds, just and true. I mean, if we if we wanted to find out if God was just, I mean, they're they're praising Him for being just and true are His ways, and your righteous acts have been revealed. Mm -hmm. So within that song even though we right. might get this small picture of the wrath of God and the grapes and the wine press and everything. We also get in the midst of all of this, because in, in between the wine press and then the seven plagues that are coming, we have this small interlude here mm -hmm. that tells us that God is just and true, that his mar his deeds are marvelous and that his acts, uh, that his, his acts are righteous. Mm -hmm. And so it, it brings us back to the true, to me, at least to the true image of who God is, uh, amongst, you know, even some of these difficult, difficult yeah. passages. Yeah. Very good. That's helpful. Thank you. I think you can go back. So we've seen 14. We were there tonight. Uh, go back. And here's a similar one that we saw in seven. Great multitude that no one could count from every tribe, nation, people, and language. So we need to let that help mitigate uh, sometimes our justification for saying there's only a few of us that are going to make it. And we tend to usually be in that first person plural, uh, you know, Narrow is the way, wide is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way you be there that find it. But what we see here in Revelation is multitude, no one can count, every tribe, language, people, and nation before the throne. And wearing these robes, white robes given, and salvation belongs to God. And so we see a similar heavenly image. And if we like, words sometimes for praising god we can we can use these we can we can come to this or we can we can come to go to isaiah 6 or take some of these grand scenes of of being in the presence of god salvation belongs to god who sits on the throne to the lamb praise glory wisdom honor thanks power strength i think
count those. There's seven things there, sevenfold completeness. Be to God forever. All the elders and the others uh, before the throne of God, serving him. And, um, 17, the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So that's not just at the end of Revelation. That's but that's part of what we find in our life with God even today here on earth. So it's not just when we get into God's actual presence, when we are still before the Lord, we are focused on the lamb at the center of the throne. He is shepherding us. He's the good shepherd of Psalm 23. We say the Lord is our shepherd. We think of him like God the Father, but Jesus comes and fills that role in John 10. I'm the good shepherd. So Jesus, when, we, when we're still before him, he is shepherding us through the storms in this life, the dark shadows in this life. Uh, and then he, of course, in 23, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death and the dark times, uh, he steadies us. He is there with us. He is Emmanuel. So again, to me, that's one of the things that helps calm me more. I don't have answers. I read it just today. I easily go back to it. Um, let me make one quick attempt, and if I don't get it, um, I will use uh, Readwise. It pulls things that I've highlighted from Kindle books and my highlights. And it should come. And that I just added today from Hugh Ross, a not a cosmetologist, he says, but a cosmologist. He's been introduced as a cosmetologist. Yeah. And he said, no, I'm a cosmologist. But one reason the problem of evil has persisted as an argument against God may be that we struggle so mightily to identify what eventual good could possibly justify the magnitude of sin's horrific impact in our world. In Stanger's words, no one can conceive of a reason God could have for allowing so much suffering. And, and so I, I read that and thought, yeah, those are the kind of things that I want to keep in mind because one of the classic arguments against God, either he's not all good or he's not all powerful. And so that, that argument persists, and I appreciate just finding different ways to say it. We struggle so much uh, to understand what good in our world today, and especially if you follow even the plight of our brothers and sisters, but our hearts don't just go out to brothers and sisters who suffer. Uh, to to unbelievers, let me, uh, uh, because of the kids in the refugee camps in the Democratic Republic of Congo that we're helping to feed, they get pictures of some of the kids with deformities, the physical deformities, and they don't have any treatment there. They're not necessarily believers, but our hearts go out to them, of course. So what good could come from all of this suffering? And, and there's no answer given right here. I mean, this other writer, Stanger, saying no one can conceive of a reason God could have for allowing so much suffering. We can't come up with it in, in our mind. And so when I'm faced with so much pain and suffering and sometimes hear from our brothers, whether in Pakistan or DRC directly about some of that suffering, you know, it, where I was 25 or so years ago after the genocide in Rwanda in 94, 95, 96, it's like kind of angry at God. Why do you let all this happen? Now it's not that. It's I don't understand uh, how all of this is arranged, but what I know is you're with us in it. You, you didn't exempt yourself from that evil. You suffered death on the cross, and now you are with us in all of this you suffer with the still and so the presence of god again emmanuel god with us is the greatest consolation to me now i don't have 
I don't have an explanation for why good and evil exist alongside each other. And I don't think we should feel like we ought to have, be able to have a, I think it would be trite if we came up with some explanation. But what I know is he is with us through it. Now, if he were just up there, out there in the cloud somewhere in heaven, wherever that is in the cosmos, then I'm not so sure about how good he is. But the fact that Jesus, Matthew 28 says, and I will be with you always through the end of the age. He is with us in all of these unlikely disguises of those who suffer. He is still here, Emmanuel, with us. And so that, and, and I picked it up. It's not just a great insight on my part that it's come to that. I've heard it from some other good and wise teachers that that's our, our greatest consolation is that he's with us alongside us in the midst of all of this that we're faced with. Well, any other thoughts, reflections from anyone? If not, we will stop early. <laughs> Many minutes early or so, and that's okay. Uh, we, they've been longer because sometimes we need some classes require more. Sometimes we need more time, but it's fine when we don't. We don't. We don't have to fill it. So we will pick up again next week. So till then, the Lord bless you and be with you this week. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. <clears throat> Ooh, who